Coles Bio says responding to climate change requires both mitigation and adaptation. And as a person who's been doing climate change um, science presentations in Hawaii for about six years now, uh, I'm so happy to see that this message of adaptation is finally becoming mainstream. I'm sure Cole is a known, known new person to that, but I hope all of you will fully understand what the difference is between mitigation and adaptation uh, after today. Uh, he has uh, original research and experience working with institutions of higher education, corporations, and government. And he'll present content from his new book, which is Two Degrees, The Built Environment and a Changing Climate. His presentation will be organized to inform the statewide and the UH system climate response and will provide individual campuses with a framework. And so he's at requesting that we have a conversation today. I don't know if he wants to hold the questions to the end or uh, allow you to interrupt him, but uh, perhaps we should just leave the questions to the end uh, and uh, have a nice Q&A after that. But you're going to learn about resilience and adaptation planning, emerging success fa factors in coastal communities, working on outdated information, climate positive communities and zero net energy buildings, how we make decisions, the psychology of choice, which is one of my personal uh, interests, and uh, case study references for further reading. So uh, without further ado, let's just welcome Cole. So yeah, I would prefer the hard questions especially to be at the very end. Um, so I, I have worked with a lot of higher education institutions, uh, both top tier, Stanford University, uh, large public institutions like UC, and community colleges. So we've, we've covered a spectrum of, of ability and to, to invest in some of these solutions, and then also how they approach their, their staff and their students um, across a different variety of institutions. So and I've done some housing stuff. I know you guys are interested in housing. Um, a lot of labs, a lot of uh, uh, administrative classroom buildings who work on this campus. So got a lot of higher ed background. This isn't going to be just on higher ed. It's going to be a broader framework, but it's applicable. So mitigation, real quickly, who's, uh, well, I'm going to describe it real quick. So we've got, we're on a trajectory, right? We're on a trajectory of change. And there's, there's a growth of atmospheric carbon and other greenhouse gases. And that's giving rise to a general trend upwards in global temperature. And it's changing over time. So it's a very simplified graphic. And just to say, there's a point out in the future that's really bad. Really bad. But there's things that we can do about it, right? We can mitigate it, we can, we can make it less bad, and then we can adapt to it. That's the simple framework of mitigation and adaptation. The less you mitigate, the more you've got to adapt. The more you mitigate, the less. Really straightforward, really simple. And they, they closely overlap. And the two degrees, the two degrees is what all the scientists have said, keep it to two degrees, or we're in a very bad place. The reality is that we may already be far surpassing two degrees. The other reason we talk about two degrees is that small changes, two degree shifts, in our attitudes and our behaviors can have big impacts. So if you have these two things, mitigation and adaptation, some people like to describe it as reduction, reduction in greenhouse gases, more energy efficient, and then resilience, how do we recover, how do we resist, but I'm going to focus on this topic, mitigate, adapt. There's a lot in all of this. So in the mitigation side, you've got the science of mitigation, how we make choices, the community scale, the individual building scale, existing buildings, integrated design, which has been a big topic in recent years, the policy, the business side, low carbon economy. On the adaptation side, really it's just emerging, right? So there's this whole, how do you do it? What's the planning for it? What is resilience? What is vulnerability? How do you do it successfully? And then how does it vary? Whether you're inland, coastal, going to get warmer, wetter, hotter, drier. You guys are going to expose a lot of, you're not going to obviously be too inland, but you know, you're coastal plus you're going to have this warmer, wetter, hotter, drier in different parts of the islands, right? Past investments and effort, a lot into science. And we've invested mil hundreds of millions of dollars into the science. A lot quite down here, almost nothing really in adaptation. A lot of the, the more significant adaptation work has actually <coughs> happened in, has been investments towards developing countries. Down here you can see. Because of the vulnerability of those countries. So what's emerging, like what's changing, right, in the, in the now and the years ahead? 
a lot more on the adaptation side. Over here, you see science, you know, it's still going to happen, but people are, you know, that's kind of figured out. A lot of people are, are comfortable in a lot of ways with respect to science. It's getting downscaled to the local side, but mostly it's, it's uh, there's a lot of good baseline there. A lot on psychology, the choices, how people change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, a lot about the carbon economy, climate positive buildings, sorry, climate positive communities and buildings. So when uh, Aurora asked me to come out, these were kind of the high points, right? The psychology, I think somebody was saying that they're really interested in the psychology of choices, uh, the, the community scale, not just the building scale, and then adaptation as a whole, right? This is because this, from a policy standpoint, hasn't really been addressed. So I want to push a couple things today. And unfortunately, <coughs> the policy conversation is happening. So I hope one of you guys will review the policy and say, you're not dealing enough with this. You're not dealing about how you're not you're not planning for how we're going to have to adapt to our changing climate. The other thing I want to highlight is that the scale matters, right? We look at a lot of solutions at the, the building scale. There's a great deal of, of opportunity at the community scale. Let me talk about that. And then the, the the culture, the society, the connection of people, how people decide to act, that is very important. So I'm going to try to at least get those through and then somebody can uh, comment on the policy. And we can, this is a bit of a choose your own adventure. So I'm actually going to decide based on our time that we're not going to talk about <coughs> the building stuff. And I'm going to talk, we have until 11.25, right? So, do you guys want less of me talking? I, I, let's, let's do this because I, we can come back to some of this. So. I can talk for the entire time, or I can, I can leave a lot of time for discussion. So how many people want to hear me talk for a long time? Actually, before you raise your hand, how many people are here today? Just raise your hand if you're here today. I got two hands. OK. OK, I think I got most of you. Okay, how many people want to hear mostly from me versus have a, have a conversation with each other and maybe get some feedback? So mostly from me? A question? Yeah. Uh, given what you've presented so far, I'm very impressed and uh, pleased with the concepts you're presenting. I'd, I'd like to hear more of that, okay. because this is quite an original way to think about the problems, in okay. my opinion. Great. So, okay. So one vote for me talking the entire time. Uh, how about, how about the rest? Mean the entire time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, for a long, I'll try to... 75-25. Okay, 75-25. Okay, <laughs> versus how much conversation and me kind of participating in the conversation. So how many, me talking until say 11, 10, and then 15 minutes for conversation? 20 minutes of conversation? Yeah. Raise your hand so there's actually a vote here. 20 minutes? 45 minutes of conversation? No. Okay, so like 20, so I'm going to do it, like, I'll finish within... Maybe 40 minutes. I'll talk for 40 minutes and we can talk for like 25 minutes. Okay? So I'm going to go through, I'll skip around a little bit, but I'll generally talk about climate positive communities, then talk about psychology of choice, and then adaptation and resilience. So you know what's coming. So climate positive communities. The interesting thing I think about communities is that they're this, this right spot for, for more synergy, more collaboration, than, uh, than efficiency. Efficiency doesn't make as much sense at a community scale. Efficiency makes sense up here, you know, at an individual building scale, room, residence. But down here, there's just so much connectedness that you start to talk a lot more about synergy, working together, the systems, the people working together, right? So there's a process for how you could create a climate positive community. Or a net zero, I say you want to do a net zero carbon, right? Because that's like in parlance of the time. So net zero carbon. So the first thing, and it needs to be a comprehensive approach, which means that every strategy, great idea that you think up, has a place within this approach. And then there's a, there's a prioritization, meaning there are smart things you do first, and then there are other smart things you do later. But they have a trickle-on, cascading benefit. One helps out the next, which helps out the next. So the first thing, we used to call this reduced building. But I, mean, I would say it's right building, because our developer clients didn't like the idea of reducing the building. Right? They like right building. What's the right size building? What's the right placement? What's the right texture of the building? What is the right building? What's the right program to go in the building? Do that first. Uh, right location of the building. 
Then right movement. So right movement is about minimizing the amount of movement that you need, right? So if you've got community supporting services, if you don't need to drive to the grocery store, if you can walk to get some of your basic needs met, church is local, if you're a religious goer, um, the beach is local, right? That would be you know, all these community supporting services. So you don't need to drive. But at some point, we need to build something and we need to move, right? So then you just say, well, make it efficient. So it's an efficient building. It's a lead building. You know, you put a lot into the HVAC systems or the lighting. Or right movement. You know, it's transit. So if it's an efficient form of transit, or maybe it's uh, Priuses or Leafs, Nissan Leafs or something, right? Some kind of efficient form of movement. Bicycling, right? Make it efficient. You're going to have to invest energy here, so supply it renewably. Right, so if that's biofuel in the transit, or if it's photovoltaics on the rooftop, or solar, solar hot water, supply it renewably. This is when you can start to hit a net zero, climate, uh, carbon, um, net zero carbon community. And there's <coughs> designations for whether it's an A or B, and I'm not going to get into the definitions too much because I think you guys don't care all that much, but the idea of metrics and being able to measure whether you are or not is important at some stage. So, start to get into ability to say, I am or I am not truly net zero carbon. Then looking off-site, because all this stuff is inside the community. But that doesn't make sense everywhere. You've got very dense communities, right, that don't have enough solar access. Or, so there are off-site solutions. So you start to say, well, when is it okay to go off-site? Maybe it's when it's really dense, when it's a smart transit-oriented development, then some of the buildings can be off-site authorized, and they can actually go off-site and they can grab green power. Then you start talking about climate positive, right? And climate positive is saying, well, we've gotten down to zero, but that's not enough. So you start talking about re regenerative theory. And there's really two ways to go. One is sequestering carbon or emissions, right? So that's green space, ag, right? Starting building up the quality of the soil. That would be a great way. Uh, you can also do there's technology solutions for sequestration. And the other is scope three emissions. When you talk about scope three emissions, they're generally the consumption side, right? Everybody, like I bought, I bought this fancy laptop. It was made somewhere else. There are embodied emissions in it. I'm not responsible for those emissions unless I consider it something that I purchased and therefore indirectly responsible for, and then I own that. So if it's if it's built in China, but I bought it, that would be a scope three emission. Emission. Just a discussion of definitions. One of the great benefits of this kind of organization is that you start to realize that the greatest gains come at the top. They come at the, the density, the reduction in building, the right movement, the making efficient systems. So over here, you've got a density scenario number one, which is a floor area ratio of 0 0.7. This is maybe a two-story building. Over here, you got FAR 1.2. Maybe that's a four-story building. So very subtle differences, right, you could say. The difference between, say, and these are three different design scenarios, good, better, best, as growth happens, so you get more and more growth over time, you've got metric tons of carbon per person. So you say, well, six tons of metric ton of carbon per person versus, say, three. And the difference between this density versus this density is huge. So the reason for it being so big is not just there are less miles driven by the cars, vehicle miles traveled, but also the, the buildings share walls, right? So they don't lose or gain heat so much. The systems that can go in these, these communities become more cost effective. So you guys are doing uh, um, the seawater cooling, right? Downtown, see if that's gonna happen, but downtown Waikiki. The only reason some of those systems can happen is if there's enough density to support them. So you see some shifts where there's great benefits. And actually to talk about housing, I'll try to relate housing. Housing is a great example of that, right? If you can start to mix uses, and you have housing and you have uh, office in the same area, they have totally different profiles, right? Houses are empty, offices are occupied. Offices are empty, unless they're architects, in which case they work 24 hours a day, or they're, the, and the houses are then occupied. So from a grid standpoint, there's actually a nice diversity. So mixing actually makes a lot of sense. So there are optimal scales to systems. So if you then play this out again, right? Room all the way to the region scale with maybe a campus, university campus somewhere in the middle. There are optimal and non-optimal systems. Unfortunately, we tend to think of what systems go in our built environment. 
by the history what we've done before. So we tend to put in like in virtual HVAC systems in every building. That's actually not necessarily the most effective optimized solution, right? So when we talk about optimization, how cost effective is it? That's not necessarily the most cost effective solution. We do it because it's easy to permit, for example, right? It's easy to sell off the building afterwards. So it's not a headache for us. So is it cost effective, is it available, are there good precedents, is there synergy value where systems are working together versus not cost effective, not available, no precedents, nobody knows how to do it. So if you look at lots of different technologies, this was from a project in the mainland where you have different types of technologies, a thermal energy system, right? So a thermal energy system really comes on, is effective at the building scale because you see chillers and boilers coming in at buildings. But then it's also very effective out at the campus scale. You see those at the campus scale. Generally, you don't see them so much out here, town, city, and region. Anaerobic digestion of organic waste, stupid to put in a building, right? Don't do it. But if you start to cruise out here towards town, city, region, it makes a lot of sense. So the only, and there's PV is layered on here where PV make, photovoltaics make sense. Uh, there's uh, uh, waste treatment facilities. Uh, water, so re reclaimed water. So reclaimed water you'd only start to see coming on out court, kind of towards this area. So the point is that there are certain systems that make sense at certain scales and we, we constrain the systems based on our own history not always looking at their, their optimal solution, their best use. A good example of that, this is from a university campus, uh, I guess I will say where. This is Stanford University, beautiful central utility plant, if you like those kinds of things. Um, what they've done that's remarkable is that they saw that at a community scale, they had housing, they had labs, they had administrative buildings, they had cooling for those facilities, and they had heating for those facilities. A lot of it was happening at the same time. And when you cool a facility, what are you doing? You're, you're pushing heat out of it. And when you're heating a facility, you're pushing cooled out of it. You're pushing cool energy out of the building in order to heat up the building, right? So they said, well, why don't we just connect it, right? Why, why, why do we think about individual buildings and just supplying the buildings? Why don't we connect the buildings, connect the community, and share the resource? about a 60% drop in their carbon emissions as a result of doing this, this strategy. It's going to take them 10 years. They're transitioning their entire steam distribution system to heating and hot water solution, getting rid of their cogen, going into what's called energy recovery chillers that can pump energy around rather than creating new energy or trend, uh, taking natural gas and creating new energy um, <coughs> out of it. Great example. We're also recognizing that systems take, at least these bigger systems take a long time, right? So this campus, I hope you guys come on the tour later, 2.30, because I'll tell you what this campus is going to be, not just what it is today. So you talk about, this, this is a famous town, I don't know if anybody, any transportation planners in the group? Okay, if you're a transportation planner, this is like Nirvana. <laughs> so this is in Brazil, it's Curitiba in Brazil, it's an inland city. And what's amazing about it is that it has the marquee bus rapid transit system in the world. Everybody says this is the best. But why is it the best and how did it get there? It took about 30 to 40 years. It started in the 70s with one type of bus and now they have about 30 different types of buses. And they're optimized by length of travel. So you look at this and you say, okay, here's this bus rapid transit corridor and here's all this development. But you see there's, it's not quite as dense out here as it is right here, right? So there's this, there's this pattern to the development. What came first, right? The high-rise buildings or the bus? They, they grew over time, right? They, 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 they worked together, there was a synergy. The high-rise development provided the people that the bus then could be cost-effectively operated for. It was, there was an establishment in the 70s, it was expanded, it was optimized. Now they're tuning their buses to the length of travel. They're doing wayfinding systems, all these great things. So we worry so much about, is it right today? Well, it just needs to be started, right? We just need to start right, and then we can optimize it, expand it, grow it over time. A lot of times we're just so afraid to even start it right uh, that we have a problem. There's also, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, also great synergy potential. So synergy, working together. 
I don't think adaptation and mitigation are inherently at odds or different. Oftentimes they're very closely related. So you talk about public health. Public health people, any public health people in the room? They always feel downtrodden, right? They're like the last people to re be remembered in, in community strategies. But the reality is they are all about mitigation and they're all about adaptation and they don't know it. But if you bike, right, you're more healthy, you're not driving. Great mitigation strategy. Um, heat islands, so heat islands, I'm gonna talk about those a little bit later. Raising the temperature in urban areas, horrible for public health. Horrible for adaptation, horrible for mitigation, right? Meaning that if you can keep it cooler, air conditioning systems don't need to work as hard, people are less likely to keel over from the heat. So public health is just one example of a synergy area between mitigation and adaptation. And that's how you fund stuff, right? You fund it because there's like multiple benefits, not because there's one silo benefit. Just things like walking up the stairs. Like we are a crazy people. Anybody work out in here? You work out? Do you take elevators? Mm -hmm. Very rarely. Oh, okay. Well, you're a, you're a great exception. People take elevators and then they go try to work off all of the energy that they haven't used during the day. It just use the stairs more often, right? And actually, in a lot of places, this is from a hotel in Portland, if you took the stairs, you'd be there already. Because it's such a slow elevator. <laughs> Daylighting, great mitigation adaptation strategy. These buildings, this room is largely daylighted, right? If the power went off, you'd know that this would end, but we could still have a conversation. We could still communicate. We wouldn't feel like we were locked away. Natural ventilation, similar kind of thing. Oh, this building isn't naturally ventilated except out in the corridor, but we could crack open the door. I'm going to pass by some of this stuff. Uh, well, my, actually, my point in this is, in your policy, I'm going to encourage you to learn from other cities, other communities, other institutions, right? So there was, it was great to see uh, UC up there today and sharing what their experience is. Harvard yesterday, whether it's a city or an institution, there's great progress being made globally, and how much of it do you guys share? Uh, so I'm going to pass by that, go to, let's talk about um, psychology. So I'm going to open this up by saying that I was at a conference like this, just to say good things come out of conferences. I was at a conference like this and I thought I was a genius. I don't know if anybody here thinks you're a genius. Nobody's going to admit it. I, I, you thought, okay, you and you're a genius, we have to talk later. So I thought I was a genius and I sat down at a meeting and I said, I have it figured out. I have it figured out. The most, most of the decisions in my experience with higher educational institutions are irrational. They're not rational, right? As an engineer, I, I fess up, right? My beautiful world is that you just crunch the numbers, you come out with the right answer, and you present it, and the right decision gets made. Like a third of the time. And most of the time, it's not that way at all, right? People make decisions based on limited information, not enough time because they're scared because they're overly <coughs> optimistic. Vanity. Because they're vain. Because they want to get the award, the next award. <laughs> There's all kinds of reasons why people make decisions. And we, as design kind of decision policy people, don't actually think about it enough. right? We don't think about why people are making the decision to go forward or not. So I said, well, let's, we need psychologists everywhere. We need, or we need psychologists to teach us how to interact with each other because we don't do it right. Psychologists don't react well with each other. That's true. That's really true. So I, so I said, I got to figure it out. Thirty percent of the time it's rational. Seventy percent of the time it's irrational. And he said, you're wrong. You kind of got the split right. Ten percent of the time it's rational. Twenty percent of the time it's irrational. And seventy percent of the time it's the default condition. The default condition. So the default condition is just what's happened before. You can't really say it's irrational, right? Because it's it happened before. It feels rational. You'd say it's not rational because you're not really thinking about it. The default condition, you know how to finance it, you know how to build it, you know how to operate it, you know what to expect. Nobody's going to critique you. Right? That's what we did last, last year. What are you talking about? What's your problem? The default condition is the big obstacle. The positive side of the default condition is that if you can reset it, then everything becomes easier, right? Because that becomes the new default. So, the new, so you see? The reason that UC has become successful isn't because they've had all this sustained pressure over time, but because they've been making incremental, raise-the-bar progress 
and then every time they make that progress, it becomes incrementally easier, and they don't even question. The same questions that were five years ago or ten years ago don't come up anymore. So what is the psychology of decision making? So this is a great study, this was from 1957, called the magic number seven. So the magic number seven happened in a research environment. And what they basically did is they pulled a group, kind of like you guys, in and he said, we're going to have an experiment on memory. So we're going to give each of you guys a number. Some of you guys are going to get a short number, like two digits long. Some of you are going to get a long number, like seven digits long. Maybe eight or nine. And then we're going to ask you to remember that number and then walk down the hallway and repeat it back to us. So imagine a new phone number, right? That's seven digits. That's kind of hard to just remember off the top of your head. So, but as people walked down the hallway to play back their number to the researchers, they were interrupted. And they were interrupted by a member of the research staff who had a gift for them. Does anybody know this, this research? Had a gift for them. And they said, thank you for participating in our research study. We'd like to reward you. Here's a chocolate cake or a fruit salad both really good things. The people that had the longer number invariably took the chocolate cake. People with short number more often took the fruit salad. The rational decision, right? The healthier decision. It still tastes good. So what does this mean for, for kind of decision making and policy? If you make it too complex, people default to their irrational mind. So if you make this policy too complicated, People are just gonna, they're gonna fall back to their default, right? They're gonna say, this is just too much. I, you know, I'm just gonna go with my chocolate cake. $50, right? So this is an interesting bit of research, and it was about, um, I'll say this, so, I don't know if you guys, presume for a moment that you like television. I know not everybody likes television, but you're gonna go buy a new TV. Gotta drive across Honolulu to buy a new TV to save $50. So you could buy it here, or you could drive across and, actually this is gonna be a bad example because nobody likes to drive on H1. <laughs> so, so say you don't have to mess with H1, but you gotta drive a little bit out of your way to save $50, maybe 30 minutes out of your way. Would you do it? Would you drive 30 minutes out of your way to save $50 on a TV? Some of these people with monster sharks are gonna be paying 50 in gas. Yeah. Okay, don't think about it too much. Don't think about but that. if you got a car, for 50 bucks, drive 30 minutes out of your way to save $50. It's a $300 TV down the street or a few blocks away, $250, right? Big savings, right? It's a big, and you can see all the marketing. Most people would do that. They would drive a little bit to save 50 bucks on a TV. Would you do it if you're buying a new car? So you could buy a new car for $25,000 here or $24,950 30 minutes away. Almost everybody they know that's crazy. Why, why, you know, it's, it's small. It's the same distance. It's the same amount of money, and less people would do it. <clears throat> so what does this mean for policy and decisions? Make the right decisions small within the comparison of the greater whole, right? Less, people are less afraid. It just seems like an easy check mark, right? Coin tosses. So this is an interesting one. Um, see, I had a coin in my hand, and I was giving a 50-50 bet. A one to one odds. So I'll put $100 down, match your $100. If you win, you take my 100 If I win, I take your 100 How many people take that bet? Okay, almost nobody. I'm going to trust that you guys are all still here. <laughs> How about 1.1 to 1? So I'll give you 1.1 1 .1 odds. 1.2 odds. One person. 1.3 odds. 1.5 odds. Okay, so that's maybe 20%. Of you. Are you guys here? Yeah? Okay. How about two to one? Yeah. Anybody not take that bet? Your ordinary event is where the damage happens. So in the future, yeah, we'll have elevated seas. We are going to be behind seawalls. We've got some good ground. We are going to be behind seawalls for at least a portion of the city. But we have earthquakes. So you have an earthquake, you have a breach in that seawall or the levee. You have a catastrophic failure. Infrastructure, whether it's power, uh, water, those things go out for a significant amount of time as you're trying to pump out and rebuild your seawall, right? Economic and health system failures is where the damage will really be for the Bay Area. In Los Angeles, they've got a high temperature plus water scarcity plus a non-resilient urban form. What do you do with high temperatures? You pump water into it. 
that's how you get people to cool off. They all take a dip in the swimming pool or their evaporative air conditioning systems. In Honolulu, you guys know this, energy, water, food import dependence, right? You're going to feel it. Even if it's being felt somewhere else, you're going to feel it indirectly. Uh, in Minneapolis, retreating feed lines, monocrops, wooden structures, everybody's got these kind of risk accumulation issues. What's the EHSF? Uh, environmental health and safety. Gotcha. Uh, sorry, uh, envir economic and health system failures. Gotcha. Uh, the J Japanese tsunami, right? It was an earthquake, didn't do much damage, right? Because they knew how to prepare for it. Tsunami, really bad. The tsunami triggered the nuclear, the nuclear triggered a collapse in the economy. I say collapse, a downward thrust in the economy. In Louisiana, in Louisiana, New York City, similar kind of stuff. In inland Europe, 2003, 50,000 people died in Europe. Do you guys know this? 50,000 people died. Actually, some people say 70,000 people died. What country? A lot in France, but everywhere. Portugal, Spain, Italy. I don't know if it hit Germany so much. It was kind of oriented around the, the Isthmus area. That's close to Poland pretty well. Poland, Poland also? Poland was really hot. Poland? Yeah. It was concentrated in France. That was where the real, real high heats were. So they had high heats, but not so high that it's not able to be dealt with. They're going to deal with higher heats in the future. But they had non-resilient buildings, stone buildings, didn't have air conditioning. They had cultural norms, though, more importantly, where people went away for the summer and they left their old folks at home. And the community wasn't such that you would check on your neighbor. What we've learned from some of this stuff in the big disasters is that the communities that have greater cohesion, cultural uh, connectivity, where people check on their neighbors, a lot of communities of color actually, that those communities are actually more resilient because they check, they connect to each other, regardless of the built form. So this starts to give us a framework, right? So you say urban resilience, I would say you could use this for universities as well. So what is the resilience framework for a university university system? Well, there's the recognition, the top-down scenarios. That's the stuff that it's good, you, you understand it's out there, but it's not going to get you to change. It's not going to get you to, to choose to act differently. To choose to act, you need to understand your vulnerability. So somebody's got to figure this out for the islands, for UH, for the community colleges. But that's not enough. You really have to think, as, as a community, about how you're going to adapt successfully. What are you going to do about your perviousness to sea level rise? How are you going to sacrifice certain areas versus not sacrifice others? And this six steps here is where I'll concentrate and finish off. Um, so again, remember I talked that strategies should be comprehensive. They should have you could you should put, be able to put any of your ideas in it, and then start to prioritize them, both in time and in and in economic cost. So you can do the less expensive stuff, the faster stuff now and then gradually build up to do the harder stuff a little bit later. So the first thing, building capacity. I'm going to talk about that in a second. It goes a bit to the, the community connectivity, right? How do the communities hold? It has nothing to do with the build form. Siting appropriately. You're building now, right? We're, we're, this whole area, if you come to the tour at 2.30, this whole area is going to be built out. Sited appropriately. Are you still siting stuff in coastal zones like, for example, in, in the Bay Area, some of our priority development areas where we're going to build big are in future inundation zones. That's a, that's a conflict. Build in passive survivability, uh, whether that's daylighting or microgrids to be able to island within a greater community. Design active resilient systems so that if one thing fails, the whole thing doesn't go down. Right? So what is your redundancy path? Allow for flexibility and retrofit. So if you're going to get inundated, how do you change out your systems? How do you change out your pervious materials that are in your wall systems, things like that, right? And then the last is manage retreat. I'll talk about that in a second. So you talk about building capacity. This is these different communities in different areas uh, function better if they're more tightly and, and cohesively taught, brought together. But it's also things like disaster response. You guys are already doing this, right? You've got tsunami. Disaster response frameworks. To some extent, you know that's the same thing. So you talk about synergies. You can tie these together. You're already doing a lot right. Whether you're, you're recognizing the same problem, just a tsunami versus a, a continuous rise over time, but there's there's definitely some things that are already in play here in, in Hawaii. So then I'll just pick on managed retreat. This is from Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. 
active and passive resettlement. Um, I'll read this for people who can't see. So this is from uh, the New Yorker, the Economist, I forget, one of them, uh, an article about Hurricane Sandy in the aftermath. So the saddest story of the hurricane occurred on Father Capadano Boulevard when a mother got out of her stalled SUV and took her two young sons from their car seats and tried to reach high ground, and the waves swept the children away. There were Brendan Moore two, Connor Moore four. If there were a typographic equivalent of a moment of silence, I would put it here. This could happen in Hawaii. It has happened in what you say, Hilo, right? Tsunami effect. So this is, this is and the amazing thing to me is that when we were writing and talking about active resettlement or passive resettlement, um, we said that's 50 years from now. People, that's when people are really going to have to deal. Um, Cuomo, after Sandy, took some of the $90 billion, right? And he said $400 million we're going to set aside to buy people out in particular areas. So if you're within a 100-year floodplain in particular areas in around New York State, um, they'll pay you for your original home value, even if it's been damaged. Just move and you can't rebuild. They think that about 10 or 15 percent of people will take them up on it. It still needs to go through the Fed. The Fed needs to authorize the spending of the money for that purpose. But if what happens if 10 or 15 percent of your neighbors sell out? Right? That's either great because you didn't like him, right? And now you got park. <laughs> or it's terrible because now your home value is going to go down and down and down and down. So active resettlement is what Cuomo is doing. Passive resettlement is when everybody says, I'm not staying anymore. I talked to somebody from, from um, Brooklyn. She said, you're crazy. Those people are never going to leave. The community's too tight. So that sets this framework, comprehensive and time-based. And then I'm going to say a couple more things, which is the case against prediction and prevention. A lot of people talk about hardening infrastructure. All right, we're going to tougher. That, I think, is a big problem. Because what you're dealing with is past conditions and your best guess at the future. But that's just your best guess. I guarantee 36 inches is wrong. I guarantee it. That's what you guys are designing to, right? 55 inches in, in Bay Area, I think that's wrong. So how do you deal uh, with, with uh, um, that ambiguity, right? Not knowing. So single system planning versus and maladaptation. You can fix one thing and then actually create problems down the way, right? So you create a seawall that actually can scrub the coastline, right? So down, just down from there, right? So there's, there's cascading bad things that can happen as a result of your adaptation effort. And then emphasis on constructive interventions versus like the community interventions and the soft interventions. So versus an integrated approach to adaptation. This is what you guys should have in your policy, right? How do you integrate? the UAH system into integrated adaptation or re resilient strategies. Safe failure. You are going to fail. I guarantee it, right? It's, you're going to have flooding. You're going to have collapse of systems. How do you make sure when it fails, it doesn't, it, it, it's not catastrophic? Um, avoidance of costly maladaptation through more holistic strategies, and then soft and hard strategies to build adaptive capacity over time, right? You establish it, and then you expand it, optimize it, find its maximal solution. Talked about heat island reduction. I wanted to, to some extent, leave you with. Let's see. I think I'll leave you with this one. Let's see if I can remember how to pronounce this. Chun Get Chun, I think, in Korea, Seoul. This looks like a rendering, right? Like this is a possible future. This is real. They took out four lane highway, four lane highway plus the the systems around it. And they repaired and allowed the original. Well, that's you, but that's not your generation. I mean, your generation got us into this mess with a lot of the actions, right? I mean, yeah, but the generation <laughs> I'm teaching to, at least at one word, is not accepting it. They're, uh, they're denying it, I think. They don't want to know this. Um, and, and I. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I think. I'm puzzled. I don't know. I think. I don't know if it's denial or if it's um, been broadcast much, or if they don't understand it, so or if they don't trust the medium that you know, provides this? I would like to respond to that because it could tie in something I wanted to ask as well. Um, I think it's, from my perspective, is Can that we're constantly, oh sorry, Nathan Albritton, the Hawaii Pacific University grad student, 
Um, I, you don't I have think, to stand up if you want. I, should, well, I, I, I actually stand like standing up, to oh, be right. honest. Um, I think it's a, a matter of we use fear as a motivator. And you were talking about motivation and getting people to act. We use fear. When, when people are saying you should use it? Or saying you, you should not. You should when not people constantly use fear as a motivator, eventually they shut off. They can say, what can I do? And they back off. You know, it's not, it's not a motivator, truly long-term motivational. You really need some kind of deep vision to really head towards. Um, not a, it's not something to run away from. Fear turns people into mindless sheep. They do what they're told. They do from the top to, to the top-down model. And people feel unempowered. They're, they're, they feel I'm powerless. You know, so I, did, I disagree with from frustration because you're there teaching this and, and you know, and it's just not getting over. That's why you say, hey, damn it, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, then you go to fear. But everything's a crisis these days. I know. Fear, fear drives That's the exactly it, isn't it? Yeah. And, and we don't want to hear another crisis. Yes. <laughs> well, well, I mean, so. You didn't say, hi, I had a nightmare. So, yeah. Let's try to, if you'll kind of give me an eye, then I can circulate and give people um, this guy and then you. That, that'll, oh, that'll help keep I, the flow going. I, I, no, I think this is really important. Uh -huh. What's your name and your Well, I, I'm Mark Clement. I'm at the University of Maui. But um, I mean, fear drives the biggest businesses on the planet. Uh, prescription drugs, the medical system, insurance. I mean, fear is already being used. It's a, it's a marketing tool, and it, and it works. And sex uh -huh. is the other one. But you know, I, and guilt. I guess it was it, kind of, some of this that was being said is what I wanted to ask you too. Is yeah, okay. So we've seen we're resilient. We're ready to take stuff on. We know that in the back of our head. You know, that's kind of a human thing to be resilient. That's part of our problem because we figure we're going to deal with it when it comes. We don't have a good sense of how bad it is because when your crops fail, when your water's going, when all these things happen at the same time, it's really hard. And that's where I think you're right. If you're trying to paint that picture for people, it's like it's hard to even conceptualize because it's nothing like, you know, two degrees of temperature. Okay, I can deal with that. That's a, two degrees of temperature, three degrees of temperature might su shut down ecosystems. And then you don't have things growing. And then you don't have things that uh, fuel your economy, fuel your body, fuel your vehicles. Everything changes. So it's a very difficult thing to express to people. But we also are, are, are an irrational population. All of the stuff that you showed us up there, we don't want to make bets that are rational unless it's like, oh, you know, two to one for me, then I'll make the bet. Or I don't want to drive to save this amount of money in this situation, but the same exact situation, I'll do it. You know, we're not, we're not logical, we're not rational, and so we're gonna be a democratic society and make logical, rational decisions based on something that we don't wanna face. So my question, you know, to you sitting through all this is even if we have really good, you know, ideas or one person or one group does, how would you implement it? Because we've already decided that 36 inches is our policy in answer to your question, they've already done that. Well, what, what happens when you're really wrong? And you've already made that decision. You're sunk in, you know. And we decided to pay thirty-five million dollars for that wave machine, which is a green vanity project. And then it sank, and it's like, geez, you know. Or you guys spend one point six billion on on Highway H three, when one point six billion could probably give us a, 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 an electric grid that would really work, where you could put some real renewables in Hawaii and stop capping solar and put so some. Can I take a passive response? Yeah. So, yeah, so, so, yeah we're, we're, so how do you how do you make how do you get these things uh, you know to, that actually make sense to an illogical population when it's it, it's hard to explain the problem why you need to do it. So, I the the, the challenge with this is that um, that it's a, it's a continuing discussion because from my standpoint I said exactly that right we need to be more in tune with the irrational decision making right you need to recognize exactly what you just said I would make too, ma too many rational arguments without recognizing that there's going to be a rational decision making. so people need to think about sexiness they need to think about fear I think actually is a great motivator but you need to give people an empowered outcome after they get scared so so I talked to the EPA administrator her, that was her exact question at one of the conversations. Uh, she said, do you think that we need to emphasize the downside? And I said at that point, I said I didn't, I didn't know, because usually I, I did the upside. I talked to her afterwards, and she said in her experience, direct experience, she says you have to emphasize the downside. You have to make people feel scared, but then you need to empower them. So if all you're doing is being Pollyannish and positive and, and you know, all the synergies, then people, you know, it's not that bad how it is. You know, my life's not, not that bad. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to buy it. Um, and then as far as generational, I think, uh, I, I would speak more towards um, how different communities respond to change. So whether you say that's generational, like we talk about inland versus coastal. Coastal communities <coughs> tend to have greater influx of population over time, more immigrants, um, 
they tend to change very quickly, a lot of development usually. You, and they, they tend to be, so more heterogeneous in place, but more the same the world over. So uh, you guys in Honolulu are more akin to London or to Shanghai than you are to maybe Fargo, North Dakota. So then you look at, at the, the inland communities, and the inland communities tend to be more homogenous in place, but more heterogeneous the world over, unlike each other the world over. They are less open to external influences, more open to internal trusted entities. So the Fed or the state going into an inland community that trusts their churches or their cultural institutions that doesn't trust the Fed, it's how you, I would say it's how you go in and interact with people, not so much whether or not they're inherently resistant. It's like, you're almost saying like there's kids who aren't listening. Well, I don't, I don't think that's right. I think that in some degree your challenge is to figure out how you connect with that community. And for whatever reason, they're not trusting what you're saying. So they're trusting somebody else. Maybe it's the corner store guy, maybe it's their parents, maybe it's their church. So how are you accessing that, that, act, that, so that network of trust? Not trusting me as a scientist that's coming in and saying, well, you know what's going you know what's coming. Because then you say, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Always. Right? Mm -hmm. So what does that say? So you know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you react to kind of the irrational? Right? I can be 95% sure, but people will say, well, you're not 100% sure. Well, the social reality, Adrian, it's all swagger. Adrian? Yeah, and I think what Kurt is, I, I agree with things. Like, you right. can't always be focused on the down. Like, Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. That doesn't work long term. But, but he did say a lot of bad things. Exactly. Yeah. And, so he, and, and so he said it, things were bad. It's an <laughs> art to hit the middle ground between not being, you know, desperate enough or important enough and it's overwhelming, it's going to happen, it's inevitable. It's really hard to hit the middle ground of actionable motivation. And I also sort of take a little bit of issue saying that our generation is apathy. I think that varies a lot community by community. I went to San Francisco State as an undergrad. Every single day there's a kid with a megaphone with an issue and a cause and a rally and a march every single week for some cause or another. Our camp has gotten an award for the most turnout in the Obama election. We had a 100% turnout. Every single person voted. So don't think, just be careful of generalizing because the, all the students of my peers that I have interacted with all want to be change makers. And that's across the country. I see it's kind of, it's hard to pick out which ones will do it, but there's ones that want to take action. There's also, they're more likely to listen to each other than anybody else. So you got to get a couple of students who are, who do believe it's important and to have like an actual event or an actual action they can take, something small, turn off your car when you're idling, you know, use a water bottle, like you got to give them something specific to do, saying, oh, you have to fix climate change, that, that doesn't work, there is no fixing climate change. You have to have something small that people can actually do. Take, you know, make it piecemeal. Saying, you know, trying to get general motivation for a whole crowd doesn't work. But if you can get a third of the people, it cascades. You get a third of the people to do one small action, everybody will do it. It becomes cool at that point. It's norm cascade. Come see my poster, please. <laughs> so just genius. Try. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Anybody else with a question? Oh, you guys, come on. You got the expert here. Let's let's hear well, some I, more questions. I think, I think so, so much of this comes down to ultimately lifestyle change, and this is like how are we? How do we as a, a, a population? And you use the word cool, you know, because they're when you're dealing with students that are interested in like swagger, they're interested in a, a mentality that's out there that's being, but you know, it's being portrayed by movies, TV, all over social media. This is what is cool and what you need to do. You need to get that car, and you need to get those rims and you need to get that thing and and then maybe they're going to listen to this other stuff and then us in this room if you're in if you're already interested in these things then we've all preached to a lot of choirs we've all been there where we're sitting there and, and you know everyone in the room kind of has a sense and there's good ideas thrown around but the kind of massive population shift that you need to have here where you know and, and a lot of these conversations you know i'm involved in a lot of environmental groups where you know people crack open their can of coca-cola and put it on the table and like, let's figure this out and it's like there's a lot of solutions in the subway sandwiches and the bags of chips and a lot of this you know i bring out my tupperware and i got my bottle of stuff that i made at home bring with me all the time you know how many minds i've changed even in my groups very few 
very few people I've seen that I've been working with over the years are starting to bring their own meals or they're like, it took me two years to get my, one of my environmental groups to stop buying plastic bottles of water for the, the, the room. So you're taking slow changes with the choir and we need something that's like real big. You know, when I'm in, you know, where, where I think is this that? is the challenge that we have. It right. Comes, is that change is happening exponential and humans are linear organizationally uh, in our change. And so uh, I'm going to let this, mm. instead of me talking about it, you talk about it. Hi, um, I agree with Mark. Can you say your name and your affiliation? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Tanya Pearson. I'm with the UH Mountain College in the SSM program. Um, I agree with Mark. It's hard to change people, but I want to use your analogy of Dr. King, where he, he um, addressed his nightmare by having a dream. And that's how he sort of shared his vision and it, he made it everyone's vision that way. And I think one, one of the reasons why I see what Mark does, I know Mark very well, and people don't understand. It's, it's, a, it's harder to get someone to follow what you're doing if they don't have the information. It's easy for us to sit and say, oh, well, we look, we checked, and so on. It's, we need to be, in, my mother recently called me and asked me what is exactly is GMOs, my own mother. And I mean, this is standard, and she lives in New York. It's pretty, you know, we think that this information is out there, but it's not in such a fundamental level. And so if we get everyone sort of feeling like it's their nightmare that needs a dream, it's, I think, that way we can get grassroots, basic people involved. I see communities in California that do more because they all know more. Mm -hmm. So we got one over here and then here. Okay, yeah, I'd like to follow right up on that. And what you were saying over there is that uh, one of the primary concerns right now is to change mass communication and what we've been, what we are constantly being tidal waved with every day, which takes our focus away from things that really need to be thought about. You know, I look, I'm on the University of Hawaii campus, uh, Manoa campus a lot. Many of the kids there are more concerned with their skateboards and with being cool, of course, that comes when you're 19 or 20 than they are with issues like this. But I don't think they're unaware of these issues. I think that, as someone else made the point there, what they need is very small projects, projects that they can get really into that is something interested to them personally, and that way project their needs and interests into this whole situation in a very personal way. So could you say a name and affiliation? Sorry. Okay. My name is Richard Bradshaw. I'm a cross-cultural psychologist who has spent the last 25 years in Japan, recently came back, and I'm studying peace studies and conflict resolution right now. And it's become very, very clear to me, residing outside the country, looking back at my own country, some of the primary forces in gear right now in this in this country and consumption, overconsumption and waste, both of human resources and material resources, is the primary problem. We need to focus back away from buying something new and having that satisfy our need towards self uh, actualization back to something that really matters inside. So away from mass consumption, away from buying, away from creating new cars every year, a new this and new that every day, and use our resources, build something with quality rather than quantity. That's about what I have Thank to say. Thank you. Uh, we have <coughs> just to check time real quick, because I think we're ending at 11 minutes. We might need to leave. You guys, anybody need to leave or does anybody want to stay? Anybody wants to leave can leave. I have two more th two more people. I just wanted to say, um, I think. Can you say your name? Oh, Christine Colvin, Community College. Um, I think a lot of it needs to start at the elementary level. We need to get the youngest mm -hmm. generation involved because they are the ones that are going to be 
really implementing any sustainability stuff that we start today. And for instance, Kahalu Elementary School, perfect example, they have garden beds right outside the classroom. They're getting their students involved at a young age, and I think that is super important to, you know, starting to get these generations more involved and more aware of what they can do. Not so much about what's going to happen if we don't do anything, but what they can do. What small step can they take to be a part of helping, you know, helping this world? And you're resetting the default, right? Because yeah. they, they, they represent the reset. Right. Yeah. If you start them with this at the primary level, get this implemented as part the, of their lives the now, only, The only challenge with, with, with that is that, that they, need, they need that, but then <coughs> they, they're, they're 20 years out from, from, from being power brokers, right? So, I mean, they'll, they'll have something as they go through college, but it, 20 years from now is, you know, 20, 33, right? Is that right? That gives us That's, 20 years to work with them and get that model in their heads. No, I know. I'm saying do that and. I'm saying that there, it's not enough to just focus on the children. You have to do that and focus on the the, the, the older portion of the population, right? The, the crazy grandmothers need to get involved. <laughs> so I'm going to skip you and just go back to you because you've already spoken. So That's why I'd like Art to speak. Yes, Art. Uh, my name is Art Watley. I'm a faculty member at HBU and I've developed and currently program manage a uh, master's program in global leadership and sustainable development. And I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, there's considerable amount of evidence to suggest that humanity tends to respond more effectively when their crisis happens. I mean, we can all talk about being visionary and proactive and all of that, but for the crux of humanity, we tend to be very responsive when crisis occurs. So how do we get around that? And I want to bring just to make a couple of points about how to get around this crisis tendency we have. Uh, and they relate to what we, the role we're playing as students and as faculty and as administrators in higher education. Because the opportunity is right in front of our face. But we're members of an institution that is notoriously lethargic, notoriously conservative. And so how, what can we begin to do, students, faculty, and staff? I think there are a number of things that we can do that we're not doing. I think students can aggressively start talking to their faculty and telling, asking, begging faculty to change their curriculum to adopt sustainability concepts and principles and the kinds of things you're talking about. I think that's certainly an active role for students. Planting gardens? Yes, indeed. We're doing that at HBU and have done that and we'll do more of that. But students need to begin to put pressure on the system because the system is inherently conservative Default. and reluctant to change. We're locked in, uh, you mentioned it, we're locked into the default position. In fact, we pride ourselves on being locked into the default <laughs> position. <laughs> so with the exponential change that's happening in the world, how do we move past that default position in a, in a proactive way that prepares, educates people, young kids, the next generation and their generations for the kind of world that you're uh, presenting here. That's, you know, it's happening. I want to talk to you more about this later. But. So, and what can faculty begin to do? My goodness, talking about herding sharks, uh, well, I shouldn't say, say it quite so harshly, uh, herding sh uh, uh, cats, maybe that's the one more gentle. But how do you get faculty to begin to adopt and include sustainability into their curriculum? Robert Orris, David Orr at Oberlin says it very clearly. Every discipline has a sustainability dimension to it. And we tend to patently ignore that unless you're environmental science or something. And then the other point I would like to make is business schools, business education contributes to the continuation and this is what I do, I come out of a business tradition and my work in Europe is with business schools to get sustainability in the curriculum. Business schools perpetuate the current economic, the hegemonic and totally irrational, back to, well not totally, but significantly irrational, non-rational economic assumptions that drive this economy in the ground over the sustainability cliff against the 
building that you showed there, you know, where that might motorcycle economically. So we've got a lot of opportunity in higher education. We just need to begin to initiate, take that power and begin to actualize it and get it going. So who in this room, can I get a commitment, you know, who in this room will say that there needs to be a resilience or an adaptation element to the UH policy on sustainability? <laughs> so, who, so who will actually say that there needs to be one? Because there's the policy discussion is, is going on outside of this room. So I guess my question is, if all of you guys wrote after this meeting, because you're going to get a, a draft of the of policy, and it's not in there, somebody is going to have to say that it should be in there. And what happens most often is a tragedy of the commons where nobody says it because they think everybody else says it, or, uh, well, I guess that's not actually tragedy of the commons, but nobody says it because everybody, so if you guys all say it, then they'll definitely get it. So I just wanted to say, if you guys commit in front of everybody else, how would you put that? Is there a good place to find? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Hold on that. With all due respect, let me just, well, I, let me just, just go to her. Because finishing she what he said, because he just asked okay. us to do something and... Yeah, let me just... Say your well, name and affiliate. I'm Beth Sanders. I'm, back. I'm from um, the University of Hawaii Center in West Hawaii. And I just wondered if there was a good example of where we could find the wording that we yeah, could recommend. Um, so now for higher ed. Back, for higher ed. <laughs> Well, for higher ed? Yeah, I, I mean, that's what we're at. But if it, I mean, some other place would still give us some, a starting point. Anything in your presentation that would be a good starting point for wording that we could use? I think that she's asking You know for what, if you follow up with me, I'll write something for you. Okay. I, I, I'd Thanks. be happy to write, if it's a one-liner or mm -hmm. a paragraph or something that says this is, you know, kind of a, because there are elements that you should emphasize, right? Okay. Um, and I think that the trustee paragraph versus, or the regent's paragraph, yeah. versus the policy, the four-page policy document can have different levels of that. I mean, maybe one word, honestly, in the regent's paragraph, but it may actually be a paragraph in the four-page. Okay. So, so right now on the table, I have Adrian, and you come back to you. So, um, I was wondering, especially in regards to like the preaching to the choir problem and the choir not changing, is we, as humans, we forget chronically that Things convince humans besides other humans. It's not just social. It's not just human-to-human -human contact that makes changes. It's physical stuff. It's non-human actors have a huge voice. The sol rise of solar in Hawaii was because oil went up. The transition away from nuclear went away in Japan because of a tsunami. The reason why, but it's my case, the solar declined in Hawaii is because the power lines can't handle it. So if you're having trouble convincing a community that is in the know, that wants to make a change, make sure there's not a non-human barrier that's in the way. Because <laughs> otherwise, you know, you can't change a system if there's something that's physically blocking it. And then attack that one specific problem with, you know, another, you know, chain of reaction to get over that roadblock. So can you say your name? Please? Adrian Clyde, HPU student of Dr. Watley. Thank you. Solar rose a lot because of, of subsidies and incentives as well. Yeah, well I mean, because you know, oil went up and it didn't stop people from continuing to buy trucks, big trucks at that. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of factors. There's, there's, yeah, but I guess I guess more on the resiliency thing. Can you give us a, a better idea of how? Because you know, I've looked at the sustainability policy and I've been dealing at, at UH Maui with uh, uh, you know even something as simple as a zero waste policy, where it's like we have a trash can in every room. And, uh, you know, can we get the trash cans out of the rear to do centralized waste? Well, no, Mark, we can get you some green trash bags, though. So we've grown <laughs> Monsanto grain to, or cellulose to make a, do a trash bag to make you happy. Well, that didn't make me happy, you know. Neither did the ethanol program. I mean, a lot of these things come down to, like, good ideas written and then strange policy, very strange policy, you know, that, that seems to, uh, you know, relate to these ideas. So when we say something like we should all agree to put this in there, what do we what do we what do we mean exactly what, when we say uh, there's if there's something I think that you're right there's a power in this room, and we all get to send this email, and maybe we, you know we could have something a little more specific. I mean if we just bring one thing out of here that we could all put in there that we'd like to see addressed, and with that power behind it, then maybe there's bigger ideas how we can refine that afterwards as well. Okay, so for example, I would just make sure that either adaptation or resilience as a word shows up in the regions paragraph. Right, so that it's not all about efficiency and and uh, health, and it, it just there's a little bit of a flavor of 
the future. Give me an example. I'm taking an SSM program, which is highly business concentrated, and I'm turned off completely by taking the business classes because they could care less about the sustainability component. None of it, it, it none of it's integrated in the business side. And so it's just pure torture for me to take business classes. Pure well, torture. efficiency is. You know, that's <laughs> happening yeah. everywhere. Efe efficiency is coming into business and we see that. I mean we see this stuff gets yeah. more expensive, fuel efficiency gets more expensive. See this stuff is this is happening. <laughs> and, and, and we'll continue. And I guess so what I wanted to close with because I, I for, for me to close it, I, I really liked your last uh, slide with the Korea uh, with the, the highway that's been now been taken over and so I'd just like to say something positive to because I've said a lot of heavy things here, I think. But uh, you know, we use the word resilience, but um, for me, a lot, a lot of the changes that I've made have been really positive changes. Positive changes for my health, positive changes for the way that I live, and, and what I said before about my Tupperware, my, and my, I eat so well, I drink so well. I, at all these meetings, all these things I go to, when I've got, I've got the best meal at the table, and I don't care where they brought theirs from or ordered theirs from or whatever, I've got the best drink at the table. I, I made this thing, and I, I go to the farmer's markets twice a week, I spend less money than all. I've got friends that are financially challenged in all different kinds of ways, but they seem to have money for snacks. They seem to have money to go buy. I, I've never, I haven't bought a Coca-Cola bottled soda, bag of Doritos. They have money for stuff, you know, or poor, you know, sometimes you've got, you've got money for certain things that you don't want to get rid of. But, you know, think about going to your farmer's markets and, and think about telling your friends that kind of thing too. Your money goes a, a lot farther there. And it's so much better and for, for all these other things. But again, it's, it's not just resilience or adapting. It's I'm living great. It feels good, you know. And that's maybe the, the positive thing that, you know, I, I'd like to try and push the people with that. It's an example. Yeah. Oh, we got one more. What did you say about farmer's markets? You know, farmer's markets really need to start taking EBT cards because that would mm -hmm. give access to the port to help and they do, these, yeah, many do in California. And they yeah. do in California. Yeah. 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 The big item does too. So before we close, I just want to say we're all involved in one central principle of sustainable development, and that's intergenerational dialogue. Yes. So we cross need, cultural. and cross-cultural, we need mm -hmm. connections to the next generation. Mm -hmm. This is what sustainability is about, is creating connections to the next generation. Well, how we do it is all in our individual approaches to open artistry. So mm -hmm. I just want to thank Cole for coming today. You've stimulated a great conversation.